Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Conservatory of Flowers Bloom Night live stream. My name is Sarah. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm joined by my coworker, Drew, and we are both joining you live from the Conservatory of Flowers. Hi, everyone. And Drew, you are in the vestibule, which is the place to be here at the conservatory right now. What's going on in there? I am. So behind me is our beautiful living wall. But as I come around here, you'll see the star of, oh, I just hit the glass. The star of the show here. So this is behind me is Tara the Titan, one of our corpse flowers here at the conservatory. Let's see if I can give you a better view. She's currently holding court here in the conservatory vestibule. Let's see if I can't get you guys a better look at what's going on here. We can see you right now. Oh, there we go. Right, there we go. So here we have Tara the Titan. Right now you can mostly just see the spade, that roughly outside part. And there, the spade eggs going all the way up. I believe our horticulture team measured it around 70 inches, 69, 70 inches tall. And this, of course, is the bloom of an amorphophallus titanum, or a corpse flower. And I just came back into the room after having been gone for about, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes or so. And when I left, it wasn't a terribly unpleasant odor. It was kind of like maybe a wet day in the forest. And now it's definitely changing to more of a... Uh, I don't know, rotting cabbage sort of a smell, maybe like sauerkraut, or, but maybe a little more funky. Lovely. Well, Drew, it's great that you should mention the smell because that's actually what we're going to be talking about this evening. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what this plant smells like, why it creates this really, mostly what people consider awful smell. And also, we'll talk a little bit about another strange phenomena, how this bloom heats up. And then last yeah. but very not least, we're hopefully going to be joined by our horticulture team, which plans to pollinate this bloom this evening. Uh, so we'll be talking about those three things, and we will definitely be answering your questions as we go. So feel free to ask your questions. And we already actually have one from Lisa, who asked, will we be able to smell it from outside the doors? What do you think, Drew? It's a good question, Lisa. So really, we've done what we can. You probably see here around the door, we've added some fans for some additional wafting of the scent. Um, because this plant is from Sumatra and the deep tropical rainforest, it is very difficult. We couldn't just leave the doors open um, and exposed to the elements because they would be too cold for the plant. So we've installed this lovely plexiglass barrier, but there are little vents around the sides so we can try to get you that very, um, I don't know, everybody wants to smell the death point. So. <laughs> right. And if there is a nice a night to get a waft of that smell, this is probably the night that the plant is stinkiest of what could be up to a 48 hour long or so bloom. So if you are Sorry. interested in trying to smell the plant for yourself, this is a good time to make your way to the conservatory. Uh, but if you're tuning in here, we'll do our best to uh, capture the smell in, <laughs> in words <laughs> as best that we can. Uh, so one thing that we did actually at a previous bloom is we took a poll of uh, our visitors and asked them what we thought the smell of this plant was like. And they came up with a number of responses. We've got everything from dead fish, stinky cheese, We've got some poop or some roadkill, rotten fruit, lots of different smells, but uh, all of these different smells together, they have a purpose, uh, don't they? Why on earth does this plant smell terrible? It's not just for our amusement, it's definitely for another animal. Right. <laughs> definitely, yeah. So I think as humans, we like to think of pollinators as the very nice kind of uh, smell good, feel good type of characters like bees and butterflies. Um, but really just about anything could be a pollinator. Humans can be pollinators, the wind. So in this case, it is smelling like rotting flesh to attract its pollinators, which are things like carrion beetles, dung beetles, flies that would like to lay their eggs. You see there a picture 
Uh, it's probably one of the, they're known as flesh flies, which like to lay their eggs in rotting flesh. This is a good old dung beetle, which many of us know from, you know, watching doc nature documentaries or like rolling up the elephant dung into balls. And again, they lay their, they make a nest for their larvae to reproduce and to grow. So they're hoping that this will be a nice smelly place where their larvae can grow, hatch from their eggs and have plenty of food to eat. Um, but of course, we all know that that's not the case. This plant is just fooling everyone, including maybe us humans. Right, so they may not actually be getting a meal of rotting fresh, but they convincingly created a smell quite like it. And uh, we mm -hmm. have the chemical profile to prove it. Drew, you did a little research into all the different chemicals that this plant is pumping out right now. What yeah. are some of the things on the menu and where else in our world can we find these not so lovely smells? <laughs> it's pretty interesting. So I mentioned a moment ago that it's giving me definite uh, memories of like, kind of funky cabbage, or maybe like if you've ever overcooked anything in the cabbage family, like broccoli or Brussels sprouts, it starts to have this really unpleasant smell to it. And that is from different sulfides that the plant creates. And these are something that humans are actually able to smell in only about one part per billion, which is really unbelievable for human sense of smell. And this plant is able to crank these out in huge amounts. And so that's definitely the thing that most people will, will smell um, I think on our scent board that we had earlier, it, it's definitely up there with a lot of the foods, you know, fermented foods. My own personal theory is we smell that mostly because we don't have a lot of frame of reference as humans in 2020 with what <laughs> rotting flesh smells like. So it smells more like the things we know rather than the things we don't know. Um, one of my favorites that this plant creates, which I thought was just fascinating, is something called isovaleric acid. And I was curious to find that this acid actually exists on our bodies. It's created by a certain type of bacteria that naturally lives on our skin. They're really part of our overall microbiome that we go through living with as humans. And they turn our sweat, they break it down into different fatty acids. And one of them is this isovaleric acid, which smells like sweaty feet and maybe like a really intense Limburger cheese. <laughs> so I just found that really wild that something that this plant creates is also in our day-to-day -day lives. <laughs> and another interesting thing that you told me earlier is actually we consulted once with someone who ran a perfumery making smells that we find really pleasant. And they mentioned that some of the chemicals that you just mentioned actually go into some of our favorite perfumes. And somehow yeah. if they just produce purely wonderful smells that wouldn't work, why not? <laughs> They, it was something to the effect of the human nose as maybe not so great as it is, or so we think, we're able to pick out when things don't smell like they should. And so if we have something like, if you think of a, a pretty common perfume like jasmine, if it was just jasmine scented, you'd be able to tell right away, like, oh wait, this isn't, this is fake, right? And so if you add a little bit of that funk in there, it kind of keeps us thinking that it's, it's legit and it's a real scent. Um, sort of like if you're deeply in love with someone, you might actually be attracted to the way they smell, whether that's good to everyone or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question we got from Leslie out there is, uh, how often does this plant bloom? It's a pretty big deal when a quartz flower blooms because it doesn't sure. happen that often, right? That's right. So this plant, this is only the second time that Tara has actually bloomed for us here at the conservatory and the, the second time it's bloomed in its whole life. The first time was in 2017. Now that first bloom was really record setting because it takes around 10 years from seed to bloom the first time. And so that was its very first bloom. And now this one we have behind me is just three years later. So on average, these plants bloom every three to five years um, with the first bloom taking the longest at about 10 years. So we can safely say it's once a, a decade or so. This one we're treated to a, you know, a quicker bloom and the jury's still out among the botanic community as to why that might be. There's sadly not a lot of information known from their wild habitat. So this is how they tend to grow in captivity. Right, and it's a pretty yeah. spectacular bloom. I just got a view of a photo that you took on of the interior just to see into the center and that really deep crimson in there. It, it puts on quite a show. But if you're someone who's a, especially a, plant, a, a fan of plants that smell bad. This is really not the only one uh, that can sure. uh, produce a really awful stench. So if you come to conserv the Conservatory of Flowers other times a year, 
you might uh, smell other things here uh, that smell equally or uh, differently, but still terrible. Here's one of my favorites, the bubble file. And this is a type of orchid uh, that you can find in the conservatory that it often blooms in the potted plants gallery and various orchids in this genus. Uh, they all produce a pretty rotten stench. Oh, that one, that, beautiful, but <laughs> you know this that one. That particular one there is, uh, it's a special kind of nasty. That's the only one of the plants that smell really bad that in my experience, I've had visitors smell it and physically kind of catch themselves like, oh man, that is horrific. So <laughs> I almost think honestly, that's worse than the corpse flower, that particular one. Wow, and then one other I like to mention is the stipelia. This oh, one yeah. uh, actually is a succulent. Yeah. So we have orchid, we have a succulent, we have plants from all over the, the plant kingdom that smell terribly when they bloom and probably what they have in common is like the corpse flower, they're trying to attract these pollinators that like yeah. the smell of dead stuff that are carrying beetles and all kinds of uh, flesh eating carnivorous bugs that are also really excellent pollinators. Okay, Drew, next up, I really wanted to talk to you about one other phenomena that uh, we see, on, especially on bloom night, which is that the corpse flower is able to heat up. It's able to produce its own heat and cause thermogenesis. Yeah. And that's pretty amazing. What on earth is this yeah. plant doing? Why does it heat up? So it's, it's truly with this plant, it's mostly conjectural, but there was a study that I was reading recently that was really fascinating that they used a thermal camera and they took pictures all throughout the first and second night of the bloom. And they found out that it actually heats from the bottom to the top in pulses. And so it keeps doing this and makes sort of this like convection column. And so the thought now is that it heats up to create this sort of warm current of air going up in the rainforest. And that warm, stinky air would sort of waft out among the, the canopy and throughout the rainforest to further you know the scent along so that things further away can actually smell it you can see there a really great photo of one of the other corpse flower blooms uh, this was not terrible but one of the the other mature corpse flowers that we have and i believe yeah in this photo it hadn't quite gotten to its peak the white areas that you see should be around 76 degrees um at the peak i think we got readings up around 95 degrees which really is astounding you can also see i love that photo there you can see, and in this one too, you can see the really cold glass in the background is that like dark purple color. And there you can see it's around 90 degrees um, and it's mostly at the top. So again, you can see how it kind of pulses from the bottom to the top. And we were really like lucky to get this thermal imaging camera that let us yeah. get these. And I think we'll be taking it out pretty soon, maybe later this evening and taking a look, trying to snap some photos. And we're gonna be doing a couple more presentations like this over the next few days. And maybe we'll uh, get some temperature readings on Terra for this year that we can share with you all. All right, well, the last thing we wanted to talk about tonight was about pollination, because we already brought up the reason why this plant smells so bad, the reason why it heats up, we're all about attracting pollinators. This is maybe one of the most important things to a plant is that it's able to reproduce in its lifetime and make more individuals out there, and pollination is yeah. essential for that to happen. Uh, but as far as I remember, Drew, pollination happens when usually insects bring pollen to a flower, drop it off, fertilize, that flower and make it able to grow a seed. Where are the flowers of this flower? That is a very good question. So if I get closer over here, let's see. So you can see, you know, us humans automatically sort of designate this flower as one big flower. But really, this is a whole big structure that is holding all the flowers. And so if we were to be a little bug and we fly way down in here, let's see if I can get this to, here we go. So if we were to able to fly down inside there, you can see where the red pigment ends and it turns back to kind of a whitish color. Down at that very bottom on the center spadix are the tiny flowers. And they are maybe just a couple, I mean, I would say maybe a quarter inch across the female flowers. And they're actually arranged into different layers, so to speak. So you've got at the very base, which are, are getting ready to activate this evening, are the female flowers. And in the case of this plant, 
those male flowers aren't even open yet. They have not started releasing their pollen. And so we are waiting for beetles in the wild, or in our case, our beetle's name is Mario, who will be here to help us <laughs> pollinate this plant shortly. Uh, but the beetles would come down inside and they're hopefully carrying pollen with them. And they get the pollen from another corpse flower stuck all over those female flowers at the base. Now on the second evening, so this will be tomorrow night for this plant, then those male flowers that you see there in the photo will start releasing their pollen. And at that point, all the beetles who've arrived this evening will, are, will still be there waiting you know, to escape. And the plant will cover them in pollen before letting them go. So it's really this perfect system where you've got the female flowers waiting for pollen to arrive. Once all the pollen has arrived, the female flowers are pollinated. They can start making seeds and the male flowers can then release their pollen. And this avoids the plant pollinating itself as most um, biology has figured out over evolutionary time that breeding with other genetic members is always a better choice that you get better results um, with your offspring. And so this plant has sort of taken that to the ultimate level of preventing self-pollination completely because the two parts are not available at the same time. Quite a complex life for this plant. Amazing. So speaking of pollination, we were actually able to get pollen from a neighborhood bloom. Of course, we need to acquire pollen from another bloom that's happened recently. Uh, were we successful in, in locating some, some pollen out there in the world? We were. So our friends over at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo just had a plant named Musty bloom, I believe in early July. And we were able to reach out to their horticulture team and acquire pollen from that specimen that we'll be administering sometime this evening. I believe that was their first corpse flower to bloom on the campus there at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So I'm sure that was really exciting. We're very excited to have them sort of join us and, and help us out uh, in pollinating this magnificent plant. All right, well, we'll be looking forward to that and we'll be sure to be recording that pollination when it occurs. And we'll be looking forward to the, the pollen from Musty. But let's take a few questions from our, our viewers because I've seen a few more pop up. Uh, someone asked, how big is the quorum? Maybe we should start with explaining what the quorum, the quorum is and then, and then how big it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to see. So bear with me here a second. There was a bit of it that was visible. Um, I noticed as that we were watching the growth. So let me see if I can. Apologies. I'll just switch my camera around again. But I promise you it's worth it. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, there we go. So now if we look down here, so you see the bloom comes all the way down to the soil. And then right here, so you see this part that's, it looks kind of like wood or something here. That's actually part of the corm. In this particular species, and many of you from Morphopalus, it's okay that it's sitting right there at the top. Um, they don't really want to be planted too deep, to be honest with you. And so the corm is huge. With the Morphopalus titanium, it can be over 100 pounds easily. The largest one ever recorded was up to 348 pounds, and that was at the Royal Garden in Edinburgh. Um, really, these are just incredibly large. They say that they have to be around 50 to 70 pounds, the corm by itself, before it'll actually even bloom. So it's really quite a job. I mean, I imagine our horticulturists have to uh, have a team of them uh, to take care of this plant and repot it. Right, and that quorum it is basically the powerhouse of this plant. It is where all the energy is stored in order to produce the, the bloom that you're looking at. So uh, in years in, that this plant doesn't bloom, it will often put up a huge leaf that photosynthesizes, creates lots of energy that it then goes down into that quorum stores up year after year before it produces a bloom like this. So we haven't actually weighed that quorum recently, so I can't no, show yeah. you by weight, but it's quite big. It takes up that, that whole pot, I think it's safe to say. Uh, and yeah. it actually might shrink down a bit after this bloom, after the expenditure of that energy, right? That's right, yeah. It's a, sort of like a potato is a, another underground storage structure. The corm stores all that energy for later use. So with potatoes, it works to build new plants in the future. With the corpse flower, it saves all this energy over and over, year after year, to make this bloom that you see before you. Yeah, and I think that that, 
answers the question of dots dot as well uh, that we just put up. What does it look like under the flower? That's the structure we've been talking about for the last few minutes called the mm -hmm. corb. And I would, if, if you compare it to root, a bulb, a tuber, I think probably most like a tuber. I think of it almost like a giant potato-like structure. Yeah, uh, I would agree. Officially, we call it the corm, not the corn, the corm with an M on the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're a garden fan out there and you like to like you plant um, flowers like annual bulbs and things, um, a gladiolus is the best example of a corm that I could give you. <laughs> Great. All right, well, Drew, how is it looking out front there? Are there lots of people coming up to see our bloom this evening? Got it's a definitely been a little busier. There's a few folks out there. Um, definitely a few folks that have been kind of, I think maybe they're doing some walks in the park with their dogs, and so they'll come by and check it and then go for their walk and then come back, because it really does change by the minute. I mean, it's people keep asking, you know, what, what will I see later? And I kind of keep saying, the only time it'll look like this is now, and it'll look different when you come back. <laughs> Some of the best <laughs> truth I can give you. Right. So we'll be open until nine o'clock this evening if you want to come by and take a glimpse, take a whiff, oh, and take a photograph. And, and we'll yeah. also be back open tomorrow as well. Um, and hold on, Sarah. Look evening, who's here. It sounds like, oh, right on cue, we have Mario, our horticulturist, who's just arriving. You can do it. Wild Mario. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll switch it over to a view of you folks. And Mario's taking a look, trying to find those flowers at the base. And the plan is to uh, attempt to pollinate this plant with that pollen that we just received in the mail from our friends at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. The, the pollen from Musty, the corpse flower bloom that uh, popped up in July. And they, they've carefully preserved that pollen, shipped it to us. Drew received it in the mail. And now Mario is going to, I believe, uh, actually he'll need to uh, perhaps cut a hole in the side of the bloom in order to uh, access those flowers below. One, one year he fashioned a really long stick wand-like thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah. it sounds like this year we're, we're gonna actually uh, a small incision in the back of, of the side of the plant, which shouldn't harm it and should give us no, the yeah. <laughs> Definitely won't harm it at all. That's one good thing about the spade on the outside here is that it's really, the plant makes it to be temporary. So a little bit of damage shouldn't harm it at all. I also have to say, so Mario brought in a step stool, I'm sure so he could do some more diagnostics of the plant. And as I got up onto the step stool, the scent changed 100%. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's definitely more of like a, I don't know if you've ever worked in a, like a, I don't know, like a lab or something. There's always like, like the mice die, right? And that's, it's like this dead mouse smell very particularly. <laughs> I, I, I've definitely had a rodent perish in my basement and known yeah, there you go. that smell. And that's really the closest comparison to uh, the smell of this bloom that I've had. Uh, it truly is uh, the rodent's demise <laughs> yeah. untimely in your house. <laughs> Quite the bloom. I There's have to some say. really great views of the spadix and spades. And what's really cool too. So most arums plants in this family. So I'm going to go over here really quick. We'll look at the anthurium, which most of us will know pretty easily. That lovely red guy there. And you can see a very similar structure, but that yellow part is actually where all of the flowers are. So they're wide out exposed, right? With the corpse flower, this part that you see here, it is part of the spadix, but it's a part known as the appendage, which is really just sort of like extra material. It doesn't have flowers on it, but that's the part that makes the scent. So that centerpiece is sort of exuding all of these lovely chemicals, mostly types of different oils and fatty acids that smell really intense. <laughs> so the flowers themselves, like we mentioned a moment ago, are actually way down there and you just can't see them from this view. So, all right, it looks like Mario has returned. Boys are here. So here we actually have the pollen. We can take a look at here. Oh, 
I have to say this was a lot more than I expected. Yeah. Quite a prolific plant they got over. I imagine a lot of people are shuddering thinking of allergies at this moment. <laughs> Looking yeah, no, at all that's the a good point. Ads. That's a good point. What's crazy to me, you know, uh, working at the conservatory, we often will have visitors who get a little concerned, you know, all these plants and all these tropical flowers and what about the pollen? What about, you know, my allergies? But wind pollinated plants are very few and far between in the tropics. And so this pollen is made, manufactured by the plant to stick to an insect and to be carried specifically to another plant. So unlike things that cause us a lot of allergies in North America, say like pine trees and conifers or ragweed, all these things that are pollinated by the wind, we don't have to worry about that at all. Really, these pollen grains are far too large to cause any ill effects for us humans. That's and very that's convenient. True. It's good that most plants are not wind pollinated. Otherwise, I think we would all be yeah. a lot more sneaky and sneaky. Okay. So here we've got Mario <laughs> is making a careful little incision here. And at this point, correct me if I'm wrong, Mario, we're kind of just checking to see where the flowers are in their development. Yeah, I mostly want to evaluate Okay, so for anyone who couldn't hear that, we're just sort of checking to see if they're receptive. So this plant is sort of designed by nature to have its pollination happen in the dead of night when these pollinators like we showed you earlier are actually active. So, you know, this time, I think, what are we at 7.30 or so? Uh, it's still pretty early for a night blooming plant. But anything is possible. Ooh, look at that. So you can see the color of that inside and how thick the spade is. Sticky. He says it's sticky. And uh, I'm too high. Those are the hmm. So I'm going to cut down lower. So. You want to get your camera in there? Yeah. What you're looking at are the males. Ooh. Look at that, guys. So here we can see the male flowers. Let me see if I shoot, shine some light. Um, oh, and you can actually just see. Sorry about the shakiness here, folks. So here you can see those male flowers at the very top. And then down below somewhere are going to be the females. We're going to probably need to cut a another opening. Yeah, but you can see how they're all just, it's unlike that picture that we showed you where the pollen was all stringy and, you know, coming down from those male flowers. There's nothing in there at all. Like quite yet. Additional light. There you Destroying go. There's the reference. Again yeah. of the, the male flowers, they almost produce these strings of pollen. Uh, and that's what we're looking at now. And yeah. so we'll have to cut another hole a little bit lower looking for the female flowers. Yeah. Oh, there's some light. If you want to switch back to us real quick. There you go. Yeah, that's a great view. So there you can really see the light on those male flowers. Now, another thing I want to point out here, these, we keep calling them flowers. And as humans, again, we have a romantic vision of what a flower is. Maybe you're thinking of a rose, but take all those petals away. And all you have is just the part that makes pollen in that case. And here in a minute, we'll be able to see the female flowers to see if they're receptive. Oh, there's, you can just see the females down there. My camera's not quite focusing, so it's, how amazing. Whew. The sense is really intensifying at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, here I can move this. This is so cool. And you'll also notice in here, so not only are they, you know, functionally different, we got the male flowers producing pollen and the female flowers receiving pollen, they are physically different as well. The female flowers 
um, first have kind of a, they have a stigma out at the end, which will capture the pollen. And they then at the base have what will become the fruit or the ovary of the flower. I feel like I'm carving a jack o lantern here. Yeah, it does seem a bit uh, Halloween-esque here. Yeah. All right. This is kind of cool anatomy lesson here too. You can see those male flowers on the top, and then we're gonna get a light down there. Just take a look at the female flowers. Oh, that's really cool. So there, you guys can see the female flowers of the Amorphophallus. And again, notice how they have these long sort of, they're called uh, stigmas, that at the end of that is where they receive the pollen. So at some point tonight, they'll start to sort of become really sticky. And that's when the plant is looking for those pollinators to arrive. This is Amazing. So when we do pollinate this plant, really, it is a, a great story of uh, conservation in a way. Uh, so this species that we're looking at is an endangered species, the Amorphophallus titanum. It's from uh, Indonesia, specifically the island of Sumatra, and it's endemic to that island of Sumatra found nowhere else on Earth. And in that area, it's estimated there are fewer than a thousand individuals, possibly. So. Uh, at the same time, a number of botanical gardens like ourselves uh, have a population of this plant that have, they've grown through uh, exchanging pollen, exchanging seeds and growing more individuals uh, that are persisting in this environment. Now, of course, we tell the story of this plant in hopes of uh, protecting its natural habitat in Sumatra. Uh, the wild population, of course, is most important as it's connected to its pollinators, as to the animals that eat its fruit. Uh, and it creates an incredible part of that ecosystem. But uh, at the same time, having plants like this one here to raise awareness and uh, to even have a population of these that is growing essentially in captivity is really important for conservation of this species. So uh, if we do produce fertile seeds from this pollination, uh, we could potentially share them with another garden that might want to grow this plant and add to this population of them. So it's a, it's a great story. Uh, and a little bit of hope for the species. Yeah. And, and we'll be talking more throughout the bloom and future presentations more about uh, sort of the challenges that this species is facing and what we can do to help it out. But for now, I can see on that paintbrush, the pollen. Yeah, we've got some pollen go. there. So now Mario is gonna go ahead and administer some to those female flowers mm -hmm. at the base. He checked a moment ago um, while Sarah was explaining that stuff to us, uh, to make sure that there was some stickiness to those female flowers. And he did find it's a little bit sticky. So we're gonna put some on now and see what happens. Of course, we won't see an immediate change as anyone who's ever grown any kind of fruit knows, it's definitely some time between now and when we harvest. So I believe with this plant, it can be a few months between now and fully ripe fruit. Um, but it can make, I mean, you probably saw in there dozens of flowers just in our view, but you can imagine they're arranged spirally around that center spadix, and there are hundreds and hundreds of individual flowers there. Well, a big thank you to uh, Mario and our horticulture team for sourcing this pollen, for uh, doing this pollination this evening, for taking care of this plant for the many, many years we've had it. It's really a feat to uh, go through this whole process to get to this less than 48 hour event that's sort of the, the yeah. periodic finale of, of what really is a, a long care process that goes into creating yeah. a conservatory habitat for this plant. So 
Thanks, Mario and team. Yeah, thanks, Mario. Mm -hmm. And for ti timing this pollination just right around the time we could see it too and share it with all of you out there. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, I think, unless there's anything else to report from the front lines, Drew, it might be about no, time. I would to say definitely that. come check it out. There has been little to no lime the entire time. And you'll get a nice, lovely view right now of Mario and some pollination. Um, but you're welcome to come by. We'll have staff here till 9 p.m. to assist you in picking all up. Uh, like I said, too, we've got some fans stationed around the edges so that maybe the scent, the magical scent of rotting flesh will waft out among our crowd. But I can tell you, just in the time we've been in here, now 30 minutes or so uh, on the stream, it, the scent has changed drastically. It smells much more like like rotting something. I don't know. Much, much further away from the, the pleasant um, wet day in the forest, like I mentioned just earlier today. <laughs> so. Well, as the evening goes on, we can probably expect that smell to intensify and uh, uh, we'll be true. enjoying it as it evolves. But thank you all for joining us for uh, this broadcast this evening. And as I mentioned before, this is uh, one of the first, and I think we'll be doing four more of these over the next two days. The others will be a little shorter than this one, but we'll be talking about all kinds of amazing things about uh, the corpse flower. We'll, our next one will be at noon tomorrow. Drew will be talking with a few of our volunteers. Uh, they'll be going through the whole life cycle of this plant. Uh, tomorrow evening, uh, I'll, I and another staff member will be addressing the question of, uh, is this the biggest flower in the world? You got some big hints to the answer to that question, but if it's not this one, what is? Uh, and a, a few more presentations day after tomorrow, also at 12 noon and 7 p.m. So we hope you join us. There's so much more uh, we can share with you about this plant. And also we're gonna be seeing it go through a number of different changes over the next two days. So we'll be sure to have some some fresh views and photos uh, as we watch this bloom progress. Uh, but for now, thank you all so much for joining us and for supporting the Conservatory of Flowers and all that we do to share the stories of these amazing plants, including the cork flower and so many others. Uh, we really appreciate your support and uh, we're accepting donations in the link below in this pro profile, but most of all, we are just so excited that you are curious and excited to learn about this plant. So uh, thanks so much. And, and, and thanks again to Drew, to Mario, and to the whole team. And we'll see you back here at, at noon tomorrow or come and see us live at the conservatory from any time from 10 a.m. till 9 p.m. the next uh, two days, including tonight. And the few following. <laughs> all right.